The Marine All-Weather Fighter Attack Squadron number 242 is stationed in or based in Japan, and they're called the BATS. It's a squadron of F-18 or F-A-18D fighter uh, jets and is a central component of the projection of American military might in the Pacific and a key component of any uh, American plans for response to aggression from North Korea. And so you would imagine, as the uh, Pentagon planners put a lot of emphasis on making sure that this squadron is ready all the time. Yet three years ago, just over three years ago in December of uh, 2018, a training exercise on a dark December night went horribly awry and exposed a striking and shocking level of dysfunction among the bats they are based in japan two uh, fighter jets and a tanker airplane were performing a nighttime refueling exercise which is a fairly highly complex uh, operation involving a lot of coordination and during that exercise one of the fighter jets crashed into the tanker plane resulting in an explosion and six Marines lost their lives. That evening was really just a succession of one error, one mistake after another. Following the refueling exercise, the jet was supposed to peel away to the right, and yet it had peeled away to the left before striking the refueling aircraft. Um, the pilots were using night vision goggles, none of the planes had lights on, and the night vision goggles were notorious for giving out. And that's exactly what happened during this exercise. The pilot's night vision goggles gave out, leaving him flying completely blind. Also, the aircraft themselves were not in tip-top condition. In fact, two-thirds of the fighter jets in the 242 squadron were inoperable due to lagging maintenance or waiting for parts or because they were cannibalized to take parts from one plane to fix another plane. And that had resulted in pilots who had less than half the monthly flight hours necessary to maintain their certification. So here are pilots flying who shouldn't be flying. On top of that, the Marines training and certification system was known to erroneously indicate that pilots had certifications and training that they didn't actually have. And so the pilots that were flying that evening actually were not qualified to be engaged in that training exercise. Additionally, the pilots were so sleep deprived that they, would, they were the equivalent of flying drunk. Oh, another thing is that exercises like this were supposed to be coordinated with the Japanese military because the Marines had outsourced the search and rescue operation for their exercises to the Japanese military, but nobody had bothered to inform the Japanese military. And so when the planes collided, all of the Marines on the refueling aircraft died almost instantly. But two of the pilots in the um, F-A-18D Hornet uh, survived and were able to parachute somewhat safely to the ocean. But instead of taking 15 minutes to be rescued, as would have normally been the case if the Japanese military had been informed, it took two and a half hours for the pilots to be located. And during that time, one of them died, who otherwise would have likely survived if he had been rescued quickly. Problem after problem after problem, standards that had not been maintained, concerns that had been ignored, corners cut, and an after-action report described the BATS, the, this squadron, this Marine squadron, as a place of deadly dysfunction that had resulted in a deadly catastrophe. The dictionary describes dysfunction as impaired or abnormal functioning or abnormal or unhealthy interpersonal behavior interactions within a group. Dysfunction is all around us. Dysfunction is in our lives. Dysfunction in our churches and our families 
in our communities. We live in a world that is dysfunctional. And as Christians, living in expectation of the return of Christ, how do we respond and how are we aware of dysfunction around us? I want to share with you this morning four principles from the Bible, biblical principles for how we can live lives of, well, maybe not free from dysfunction, but lives of opening our lives up to God to repair the dysfunction in our lives and help us to be agents of healing and growth in our families and communities. So before we open God's Word, let's just pause for a moment and ask that the Holy Spirit would teach us this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you would indeed draw close to us, that you would open our minds, that you would speak to us from the Bible. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, it's true, we live in a highly dysfunctional world, and all of us, because we are tainted with sin, are dysfunctional ourselves. In, in fact, sin is in itself dysfunction. God created this world to be perfect and sinless, and anything that is an aberration of God's original plan is dysfunction. It's operating in a way that's not the way God had designed for things to operate. Sin is dysfunction. And the Bible warns us that we have to be on our guard because we are dysfunctional. We have dysfunctional thinking, patterns of thinking, and it's easy for us to think that dysfunction is actually function, that dysfunction is normal. In Proverbs 14, verse 12, the Bible says, there is a way which seems right to a man, but the end is the way of death. We live in a world filled with dysfunction, and our ability to ascertain what is dysfunction is clouded because we live in a world filled with sin. Our lives are tainted by sin, and so we need something that is outside ourselves, something that is untainted, something that is true and trustworthy to help us understand what is functional and what is dysfunctional. So the first principle from God's Word is that we should look to God's Word to define what is normal and what is normative and let his counsel shape our thinking. We're dysfunctional. So we need something that is outside of ourselves that can shape our thinking and define for us what is normative, what is okay, what is right, and what is true. And really the way we do this is simply by saturating our minds with God's word. In Colossians chapter 3, the first four verses, the Apostle Paul says, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. You may have heard it's been said before, the illustration of when someone is being trained to be able to detect counterfeit money. There are so many different variations of counterfeit money that there's just impossible to become an expert on all of the different forms of counterfeit currency out there. And so what people are trained to do is to actually focus on becoming so acquainted with genuine currency that they're able to spot when something's an aberration of what is true and genuine. It's the same way for us as Christians. We need to set our minds on the things that are above. We need to get to know Jesus and spend time with him and allow his word to shape our thinking. And as we look to God's word to define what is normative, we can allow his counsel to shape our thinking. Philippians 4.8 reminds us or encourages us that we should focus our attention on what is true, what is honorable, what is right, what is pure, what is lovely, what is of good repute. If there's any excellence, anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Oftentimes, our attention gravitates towards things that are not true, not uplifting, not right. And God invites us to redirect our thinking to focus on what is true and right and praiseworthy. In reality, that is Jesus. And so as we think on him and as we focus on him and as we allow our minds to be saturated with God's word, we begin to see things God's way. And we begin to be able to recognize God's way is best. And we can detect through the power of the Holy Spirit and His guiding in our lives 
the dysfunction around us and choose by God's grace not to be part of the dysfunction, but be part of God's great plan for rescuing us from dysfunction. In 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17, the Apostle Paul says, You continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of knowing from whom you've learned them. And that child from childhood, this is Paul writing to Timothy, from childhood you've known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So the scriptures can give us the wisdom that we lack so that we can see things God's way and be able to ascertain and detect dysfunction in our lives and dysfunction around us. In fact, Paul goes on there in 2 Timothy chapter 3 to note that all Scripture is inspired by God. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman, boy or girl of God, may be adequate, equipped for every good work. And so God has given us in the Bible an incredible resource that can transform our thinking so that we can see things through God's eyes, that we can ascertain and understand what is normative in God's perspective and be able to understand in our lives what's out of harmony with God's will. We can't trust ourselves because our hearts are desperately wicked. We might think there's a way that leads to life and it leads to death, but God's word is reliable. And so as we look at a world filled with dysfunction, as we recognize there's dysfunction in our lives, we need to look to God's word to define what is normative, and we need to let his counsel shape our thinking. There's a second biblical principle as we seek to grow in wisdom and understanding in a life lived for Jesus. And the second principle we find in the Bible is that we should invite counsel from others and humbly accept correction. We want to live a life that's pleasing to Christ. And God has set us in community. God has put godly people in our lives that we can go to for counsel and for advice. And as we want to escape dysfunction and live a life of functioning for Jesus Christ, we need to be open to counsel from godly individuals and be willing to humbly accept correction. Now, how many of you like to be corrected? So John likes to be corrected. That we actually, it'd be good to want to be corrected, right? But oftentimes we, we, we want to shy away from being corrected. It's, it's usually not pleasant to be told that we're wrong. You what? You don't mind going down the right road. So Rodney's open to correction. Pass on the correction. It's good to be corrected. In Proverbs 27, 6, the Bible says, Faithful are the wounds of friends, but the kisses of the enemy are deceitful. God, it's a friendly thing to do to correct somebody. If, when someone's in physical danger, to be warned of that danger, that's a positive thing. And when someone's in spiritual danger, to be warned of danger, that's a positive thing as well. And so God wants us to invite counsel from others, especially godly individuals, and to humbly accept correction. In fact, the Bible says that in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. But we, of course, have to be careful which counselors we go to, who we get counsel and advice from, because in Proverbs 12, 5, the Bible says the counsel of wicked men is deceitful. So we want to be open to counsel and advice and correction, but we want to seek that counsel and advice and correction from godly individuals who can be used by God to nudge us in the right direction. I remember when I was pastoring a few years ago in Tennessee, one of my church members asked to have an appointment with me, and he was considering a significant business decision in his life. He was considering going into business for himself. He was going to buy a, a, uh, an auto mechanic business. And so he said he wanted to talk to me about it and get my counsel. And I asked him, I says, well, why are you asking me for my counsel? I, I'm not necessarily uh, someone with experience in that line of work, uh, nor in business. And he says, well, it doesn't matter whether or not you have uh, expertise in a particular area. He says, I believe that I should seek counsel from spiritual leaders. And so he, he wanted to meet with me. He made appointments to all the elders in the church to meet with them because he respected um, the individuals the church had said, these are our spiritual leaders, and he wanted their counsel and, and advice. We should seek out godly counsel and advice. Uh, 
some years ago, the um, stewardship director for the North American Division of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, uh, G. Edward Reed, no relation to me, but um, he had a seminar he put together on finances. And one of the things he said is, he says, God has given you your spouse to keep you from doing dumb things. And you should listen to your husband or your wife and seek their input and counsel and advice because God has put them in your life to keep you from doing dumb things. It's good for us to seek the counsel and advice of godly people. That's one of the ways that we can grow out of dysfunction into being functional for Jesus Christ. We should invite counsel from others and humbly accept correction. In 2011, Wade LeBlanc was a pitcher for the San Diego Padres. And he'd put in a disastrous performance one night, and um, he had been kicked down to the farm team, out of the majors into the minors. And he was uh, catching a cab from the airport. Oh, he was rather going to the airport because he was going to fly to Tucson, Arizona from San Diego. Leaving the majors, he got kicked down to the minors. And the cab driver recognized him and said, Ah, you're Wade LeBlanc. You know, you've got some good stuff. Oh, Wade thought, well, that's encouraging. But evidently, my manager doesn't think that because I am heading from the majors to the minors. And the taxi cab driver said, you know, I think there's some things you should think about trying to improve your pitching. And about then, Wade was kind of about to tune this guy out. Everybody has advice and everybody has input. But the taxi cab driver says, you know, maybe something like going over your head with your arm in your windup. That was a turning point in Wade's career. He got down to the minors, and as he was working with a pitching coach, he thought, you know what, that taxi cab driver may not know what he's talking about, but I'm going to try it. And so he did. He tried going up over his head with his arm during his windup, and it made a difference. He was willing to accept counsel from someone who he could easily just brush them aside, but that person's input and advice made a big difference in way. He, he got back up to the majors and, and was given a contract extension, and uh, so that made a big difference for him. You never know who God's going to use to give you some input, counsel, advice that's going to nudge you in the right direction. And so, as we look at a world filled with dysfunction, we need to look to God's Word to define what is normative. And we need to allow God's Word to shape our thinking. We need to, secondly, we need to invite counsel from others and humbly accept correction. There's a third principle in the Bible, and that is to choose to act guided by principle rather than fleeting feelings. Much of the dysfunction in our lives and in the world around us is because we choose to go based on feelings rather than principle. God wants us to think. We're transformed, the Bible says, by the renewing of our minds. The Christian experience is one of mental discipline, of giving over our minds and our thoughts to God and choosing, choosing to act based on principle rather than feelings. In Galatians 5.24, the Bible says, Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Think about the times you've gotten in trouble. Oftentimes it's because you chose to do something that you wanted to do, even though it was something you knew you shouldn't do. In 2 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul says, we walk by faith, not by sight. Faith is saying, I'm going to trust and believe what God has asked me to do, even if it's against or contrary to what I feel like doing. In Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And so we give over to God our desires and allow Him to direct our paths. You know, in Psalms, David says, the Lord has given me the desires of my heart. And a lot of times we think about that as God fulfilling for us something that we have longed for. But I think actually it's something deeper than that. And it's actually us allowing God to give us the desire for what He wants us to long for. 
So it's not God giving me what I want, but it's God giving and planting in my heart the desire for what He wants for me. You know, it's true, a little problem ignored can become a big problem that can't be ignored. And when we act by principle, rather guided by principle rather than fleeting feelings, God will lead us to address dysfunction in our lives and be an agent of reconciliation in helping to address dysfunction in our families and our churches and our communities and in the lives of others as we choose to act on principle rather than fleeting feelings. It can be difficult to confront dysfunction. It can be difficult to own up to dysfunction in our own lives and in the lives of others. It can be difficult to be used by God. It's a courageous thing to, in a loving way, share counsel and insight with someone else where God may be using us to help nudge them back onto the path that God is calling them to lead. A little problem ignored becomes a big problem that cannot be ignored. Think of uh, King David. He was unwilling to deal with one of his sons who committed a crime against um, one of his daughters. And David had a very convoluted, extended, uh, dysfunctional family. And Amnon had committed a crime against one of David's daughters, and David did nothing about it. Absalom was one of, of course, David's sons. And the, the daughter who Amnon had committed a crime against was, was Absalom's full sister. And he was angry that his father hadn't done anything to rectify, to bring justice for his sister. And that was the, 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 the root of the rebellion that Absalom later uh, engaged in that tore the nation apart and resulted in the deaths of thousands. If David had been willing to address the problem and have the courage to deal with the dysfunction in his family, it would have eliminated a problem that later, many years later, resulted in the death of of many, of thousands. And so God calls us to have the courage to confront problems based on principle, guided by principle, by God's word, with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, to help there be growth in our lives and even in the lives of others. You know, as we, as we think about dysfunction, as we think about problems, it can be easy to get consumed with what's wrong in the world around us and even in our own lives. And it can be very discouraging, focused on what is wrong. But in the midst of dealing with problems and dysfunction, Jesus invites us to keep our eyes on Jesus. Because we actually can't resolve the dysfunction in our lives, but Jesus can We can't, but He can. And so He invites us to keep our eyes fixed on Him. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 21 through 24, the Apostle Paul says, If indeed you have heard Him, that's Jesus, and have been taught in Him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted, in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God, being created in righteousness and holiness and truth. As you and I look to Jesus, we actually become transformed people. We become new people. We become changed. There's dysfunction in our lives, and Jesus wants to address that dysfunction. You know, we're living in, in a momentous time. Look at the world around us, and we're living at the very, in the very closing chapters of earth's history. There are deceptions that are coming. Uh, Satan is devising all sorts of ways to trip God's people up just before we get to the finish line. And Jesus wants to, right now, work with us to clean out that dysfunction in our lives, that sin and those uh, worldly ways of approaching things and and, uh, ways of dealing with relationships and people in our lives that are not in accordance with God's plan. Jesus wants to fix that stuff in our lives now so that we will be able to stand tall and strong for Jesus during the end times. We already noted in Hebrews 12, too, that we're invited to fix our eyes on Jesus who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. 
power of Christ, dysfunction can turn into healing and transformation and restoration. Jesus is inviting us to allow him to do a work in our lives. And it begins by allowing God's word to define what is normal for us. Not the world, but, but God's, God's word. word. It, it involves us inviting, inviting the counsel of godly, godly individuals and, 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 and having, having a humble attitude to accept reproof and instruction. It means, it means that, that we, we choose, choose to act guided, guided by, by principles, principles rather than fleeting, fleeting feelings. And it means keeping our focus on Jesus. He has the power to lick dysfunction in our lives. He has the power to transform us to be more like Jesus. I know there's a test coming up. There's a time of trial just before Jesus returns. We know there might be there will be persecution, there'll be hardship, there'll be troubles. And right now Jesus is working in your life and mine to make us more like Jesus so we can stand for him. And as he licks dysfunction, as he moves that out of our life and replaces it with us living like Jesus, we're transformed, we become more like Jesus, and we're prepared to live for him, not just now, but for eternity. I want to allow Jesus in my life to resolve dysfunction and replace it with living Jesus' life in mine. How about you? I invite you to stand as we sing together our closing hymn, our hymn of consecration, hymn number 617. We'll sing just the first verse, hymn number 617. I think we should also sing the last verse. Christians rouse fight in this warfare, cease not till the victory's won, till your captain love proclaims, Lord, well done. He alone thus is faithful. Dear Heavenly Father, today we thank you that you are a capable God, able to intervene in our lives in miraculous ways, that you're a loving God, a God who draws close to us and desires to transform us into the men and women, boys and girls that you've created us to be, to be like Jesus, and that the dysfunction in our lives can be healed through the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so I ask, Lord, that as we look forward to your soon return, that you would make this year, 2022, a year for each one of us where we grow closer to Jesus and where God's word allows us to see the dysfunction in our lives and a relationship with Jesus compels us to allow him to transform us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.